Psalms 22 and 23, lament and comfort. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do you refuse to help me or even to listen to my groans? Because God is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Day and night, I keep on weeping, crying for your help, but there is no reply. He leads me in the meadows to rest, and he leads me beside the quiet streams. He gives me new strength. He helps me to do what honors him most. Everyone who sees me mocks and sneers and shrugs. Is this the one who rolled his burden of the Lord, they laugh? Is this the one who claims the Lord delights in him? We'll believe it when we see God rescue him. Even though when I'm walking through the dark valley of death, I won't be afraid. For his closeness are near me, guarding and guiding me all the way. I am surrounded by fearsome enemies, strong as the giant bulls. They come at me with open jaws, like roaring lions attacking their prey. My strength has drained away like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart melts like wax. My strength has dried up. My tongue sticks to my mouth, for you have laid me in the dust of death. Oh, Lord, don't stay away. Oh, God, my strength, hurry to my aid. Rescue me from death. Spare my precious life from all these evil men. You provide delicious food in the presence of my enemies. You have welcomed me as your guests. Your blessings overflow. Save me from these lions' jaws and from the horn of these wild oxen. Yes, God will answer me and rescue me, for he has not despised my cries of deep despair. He has not turned and walked away. When I cried to him, he heard and came. Your goodness and unfailing kindness shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in your house forever. Amen. Everybody has had a Psalm 22 and a Psalm 23 moment in their lives. So when the Psalm 22 comes, we do cry out to God in despair. When we get the bad report that Z was singing about, we do cry out to God. When something goes wrong in our family, we cry out to God in despair. Then we've had those times where you just know that you know that you know it's going to be all right. And then you move on to Psalm 23, and you find comfort and peace there. Amen? Amen. The title of this uh, sermon today is From Despair to Hope. And um, it's interesting, David wrote both of those psalms. And Psalm 22 is what Jesus quoted when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reality is that I can stand up here and preach feel-good gospel all day, every day, every Sunday for years. But that's not our reality when we step out the sanctuary. And so we need to keep it real. 
because we're going to have some Psalm 22 days and sometime more Psalm 22 days than Psalm 23 days. Amen? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to stand for the reading of the scripture because uh, it's a lot of scripture and I'm just going to go through it quickly. We're back in Ecclesiastics and this is Ecclesiastics uh, verse 3. I mean, chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. This is Solomon writing again. Solomon is journaling, and he's journaling because he's in a state. And last week, we, I asked, was he frustrated, was he depressed, or was he suicidal, or was he all three? And you answer that however you want to answer it. Amen? So he begins with, and I know this that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added or taken from it. God's purpose in this is that man should fear the all-powerful God. Now, when he uses fear there, he doesn't mean be afraid. He means we should reverence God as being almighty, all-powerful. Respect him, not be afraid of him. Whatever is has been long ago, and whatever is going to be has been before. God brings to the past again what was in the distant past and disappeared. And basically, he's just talking about cycling. You know, one of the ways we said is there's nothing new under the sun. And you know that from fashions. One minute fashion is in, and then it's out, and then about five years later, it's in again because there's nothing else they can do with these clothes. So they just recycle the look. Moreover, I noticed that throughout the earth, justice is given way to crime. And even the police courts are corrupt. This is a CEV version, and they, they're using common English, and they're using today's nomenclature. And we know our justice system is corrupt. If you haven't figured out our justice system is corrupt, with our current administration, you'll never get it. I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everything man does, both good and bad. And then I realized that God is letting the world go in its own sinful way so that he can test mankind, so that men themselves will see they are no better than beasts. For men and animals both breathe the same air and both die. So mankind has no real advantage over the beast. What an absurdity. If we, so we're no better than animals. Well, guess what? We are animals. All right? I'll go to one place. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Bruce. <laughs> Just read the scripture. <laughs> All goes to one place. The dust from which they came, to which they must return. For who can prove that the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of animals go downward to dust? In other words, he doesn't know what's going to happen after he dies. Even at this point, he doesn't know if his spirit is going up or is going to go down. He doesn't know if the animals are going down and he's going up. Are we, are both of them going the same way. Sad state of, state of mind at that point. So I saw that there is nothing better for man than that they should be happy in their work. But that is what they are here for. And no one can bring them back to life to enjoy what will be in the future. So let them enjoy it now. So he says God put man on earth to do what? Work. Interesting. Now. Paul is writing. We done left the Old Testament. And we done moved over to the New Testament where Paul is writing after the resurrection of Christ. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made us understand that this is the brightness of his glory that can be seen in the face of Jesus Christ. But this precious treasure, this light and power now shines within us. Is held in a perishable container, that means our bodies, that is our weak, 
I'm saying it again, I'm exegeting and it's in the scripture, is held in our perishable container that is in our weak body. God has put a precious treasure inside of us. Uh, Solomon didn't know about the precious treasure inside of him. Solomon didn't have the Holy Spirit. Paul did. You see the difference? So we went from hopeless to hopeful. Right? Everyone, everyone can see the glorious power within must be from who? God, not our own. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken because we got the power, right? We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and we don't quit. Why? We got the power. We are hunted down, but God never abandoned us. Don't you hear the hope? We are knocked down, but we get up again and we keep going how many been knocked down and had to shake yourself off pull yourself up and keep on stepping amen next verse for we are alive we who are alive are always being given over to death for jesus sake so that his life may again be revealed in our mortal bodies. But then death it is at work in us, but life is, is, is at work in you. So what he's saying is Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died, and we know he died, and we shall die, but he left a life force in us that we know that will live forever. Right? If you have gotten your call, oh, that was the last verse. It just went too fast. All right. So now we have Saul. We have Solomon on one side. Solomon does not have the benefit of Jesus Christ. He does not have the uh, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He does not have the Paraclete, the Helper, the Comforter that Jesus sent after he told the disciples to go to, to and wait for the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Solomon doesn't have hope. He's looking around at his life. He's probably in his old age. He knows he's going to die, and he really feels like his whole life is meaningful because he does not believe, he's not sure if there's life after death. Paul, on the other hand, <laughs> has lived through the resurrection. He's been converted into a believer. He's received the power of the Holy Spirit, and when he sits down to write, he talks about, I don't care how hopeless and how bad things look. I know Jesus. And I know the power of the Holy Spirit rests in me. And I know that this too shall pass. Amen? Two men, two different perspectives. That's why when I was studying this out, I said, oh, Lord, I'm so glad. So glad we live in the New Testament. Thank you for the New Testament. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in the old, but thank you for the work that Jesus Christ did in the New Testament. Amen? Okay. So, I, I put in your notes, I have just three points. Go back to the first point. This is a quick three-point sermon. Real quick. I put in your notes some, um, I listened to one teacher, his name is Graham Cook. I, I read his works and I listen to his sermons because he's really deep. And I gave you some of the, his thoughts on being broken and how you go through brokenness. And I kind of broke them down to three major points. The first one is brokenness draws us near to God. Uh, when, Re when Reverend Fletcher was talking about the Lord being his shepherd, I shall not have any, I, I get everything I need. When you walk close to God, uh, you, you develop a, conf a God confidence, which means you are confident that God is with you in the midst of everything right? And Graham Cook put it this way. He says, if you, got a, if you have a calling on your life, you have to go down low. It's part of the deal. And my uncle explained it to me like this. He said, Lily, you have a target on your back. He said, the moment you said yes to God, 
It said, you would serve in ministry. You became one of the devil's most wanted targets. He wants to take you out. Because now it's not about just you. It's about everybody you minister to. You understand? And so that's what Graham is saying. He's saying, if God puts a, a high call and a strong anointing on your life, he's going to take you down down he gonna let you go down and he gonna take you down because he's got to strip you from all of your fleshly desires so that your will becomes his will because we grow up always trying to satisfy who will first and then he so he has to take that and flip that upside down and it's not an easy process And so, and he said, so you can't come into the fullness of God. You can't get everything God wants you to have. You can't be everything that God wants you to be unless you go through this brokenness. And Paul says, we are a vessel and we got all of this good stuff in us, but he's got to break us down to bring it out. You understand? So brokenness draws us near to God. Um, one of the examples the Lord gave me for this, when you take your child to the doctor to get immunized, the parent goes into the office, and what do you do? You hold the child. Brokenness draws you near to God. You hold the child, right, while the doctor or the nurse gives the shot. Why do you hold the child? Because the child trusts you. The child loves you. The child knows you protect them and take care of them. And so you're holding the child, and they're relying on that. But you're holding the child knowing they're getting ready to go through what? Pain. But why do you hold them and let them go through the pain? Because it's good for them in the long run. So why does God let us, why does he hold on to us and tell us to hold on to him when we go through pain? Because it strengthens us and makes us better in the long run. You understand? Okay. The next point. Brokenness is character development. If you've never been broken, you always walk around in pride and arrogance and think it's all about me. My way or the highway. I run this. I got this. Been there. Done that know everything. It's my thing. I do what I want to do. If you haven't been through brokenness, that's your attitude. That's your MO. That's your motive of operating. Okay? But God and and, and but God <laughs> has to break us to get all of that out of us. Again, Graham said people destroy with their character what they have built with their gift unless transformation has occurred. Have you ever seen a celebrity rise up real quick and crash and burn? Because over here in the public eye, they're all this in a bag of tricks. But over here in the private, they doing ungodly, unnatural, sometimes criminal activity. And then at some point, this goes this and this comes. We call it on the down low. So brokenness starts to deal with all of this over here before this takes over and this goes down. Because God gives everybody a gift. He gives everybody a gift. Amen? So you, when, when you see a man or a woman of God, oh God, like Pinocchio with no character in a high place, Humpty Dumpty fell on a Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. But eventually, Humpty Dumpty is going to have a what? 
All right. Cut to this part over here hasn't been dealt with. Got it? Point number two, we're moving on to number three. We're sliding around, coming around to third base. <laughs> um, gifts without repentance. Last night when I was tying up the sermon, the Lord said, you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to clear this point up. And you're going to have to teach for a minute. And I'm like, oh, man, I thought I could just go and hit these three points and be out. But he said, you're going to have to teach for a minute. There is a, a scripture in the Bible, Romans 11:29, that says the gifts are without repentance. How many of you all have heard people say that? The gifts are without repentance. So you always go back to the first mention. Repentance means I wish I hadn't done something. And when a lot of time when people quote this scripture, they're saying God doesn't have to repent because he hasn't done anything he regretted doing. But Genesis 6.6 6 says what? The Lord regretted. That's when humans had become so foul and so corrupt that he regretted making us, right? And he was heartbroken. This was before the flood. He said, you ought to mess this thing up so bad. I wish I hadn't even made you. All right? So first mention says there is a point where God repented about something he did, he created. And it was us. He called it all good in Genesis 1. And by Genesis 6, he was like, oh, it's not so good. All right? So let's go to the next scripture. In Samuel, God called Saul and appoint, anointed and appointed Saul to be king of Israel. Samuel did the anointing and the consecration of, of king and the ordination of Saul the king. But Saul messed that thing up so bad. He messed up being a king so bad. <laughs> the Lord said through Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king. If the gifts are without repentance, how can God say, I'm sorry I made Saul king? Like I say, there's been some good preaching, but not good teaching. Because the word confirms itself. It doesn't contradict itself. All right? So he says, <laughs> he, and then, then the, 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 the indictment on Saul was, he has again refused to obey me. Saul walked in disobedience to the Lord. When you walk in disobedience to the Lord, there is a consequence. And when Samuel told Saul this, what the Lord had said about Saul, Saul, I mean, Sam, well, Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard the Lord that he was saying he cried to the Lord all night. Not Saul, Samuel. Because Samuel loved himself some Saul. When he pronounced the judgment on Saul, Saul was like, oh, really? Okay? So now you got two scriptures that says God can, re he can regret calling someone to serve him when they don't walk in obedience with him. You understand? All right. Gifts are without repentance. Uh, this is what I always do when I study scripture. I look at different versions. The part that we, that, you know, we lived in the King James Version so long. I was listening to Jake's last night. Listen, Jake said, only reason I use King James is because I, I learned it, and I'm too old to learn another version. But KJV says, for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. When you get under the NIV, it says the gifts, for God's gifts and his call, he changes it from without repentance are irrevocable. Okay? And then when you get down to the living version, the living Bible version, it says, for God's gift and his call can never be withdrawn. He will never go back on his promise. All right? But what 
this scripture, remember I tell you, you never take a verse out of context. That whole chapter 11 was not talking about individuals. It was talking about the nation of Israel. And what the whole chapter was talking about, when he gets to the, when Paul gets near the end of the chapter, he starts laying out his case. Go to the next, next verse 1. Paul starts this chapter by saying, I ask then, has God rejected and deserted his people, the Jews? Oh, no, not at all. Remember that I myself am a Jew, a descendant of Abraham, and a member of Benjamin's family. I'm one of the members of the 12 tribes. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected the Jews. And then from verse 1 all the way down to the end of the chapter, he's talking about God and his relationship with the Jews as a nation, not individuals. So, and even if people had gone back and just read one verse before 29, then they wouldn't have got mixed up. 20, 28 says, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of me. And what he, he's talking about, they call me the apostle to the Gentiles, and the Jews were upset that Peter went to Cornelius' house and had a Holy Ghost party because they thought the Holy Ghost party was only for the Jews and not for the Gentiles. And he really was addressing this. And he was saying the Jews were elected, and they were elected, and, but because they turned their backs on Jesus Christ and the gospel, God allowed the Gentiles to come in and be grafted in into the body. So now we're, we, we are grafted into the faith be on a, and, and because of Jesus. He's brought us in, but because he brought us in, he didn't kick the Jews out because he doesn't go back on his promise. You understand? So that's why he said, on the, go, back, go back to that verse, Joe. Because that's why he said, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. Who he's talking about? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's going back to the Abrahamic covenant. When God, and God cut that covenant with Abraham, he didn't, Abraham didn't sign off on it. God made a covenant with himself on behalf of Abraham. So God says, I will never break that covenant. And that's what Paul was teaching about. But we've taken that verse and said, Oh, when God gives you a gift, no matter how jacked up you are, no matter how messed up you are, he's not going to repent for giving it to you. He repented about creating humanity. He repented about making Saul king. You don't think that some of the things that clergy has done that have been an abomination to God, that God doesn't regret their calling? You don't think? If you, don't, if, you, if you believe that, read the book of Ezekiel. Just read Ezekiel. And he tells us as leaders, he holds us doubly. He's going to really get us for leading his people astray. We got hell to pay. You're not paying for your own sins. You're paying for the sins of those you messed up. So the next time you hear him say that, he told me to tell you all, don't listen to that. That's bad, bad theology. Amen? Last point. Brokenness takes us outside our comfort zone. Who wants to be broken? Who wants to go through pain and anguish? Who wants to change? One person raised their hand. We like us just the way we are. Amen? John Maxwell, another, another teacher that I really like, if we're going to change, if we're growing, we're always going to be outside our comfort zone. When you start growing, can you wear the same clothes you wore last year? When your mind start growing, what happens? You start looking at things a different way. 
You start seeing things that you didn't notice before. You start understanding things in a whole, with a whole new different level of revelation. Change is good. The reason, I believe that the reason God calls us outside our comfort zone so we learn how to depend on him and to walk close to him. Just like a child hold on to the parent's hand before you cross the street. Because you know you can't cross the street by yourself when you're young, even though they think they try to run out and do it anyway without you, and you have to grab them back. Just like sometimes when God tells us to do something, we think we can run out and do it, and you have to. <laughs> you're not ready yet. Send me in, coach, I got it. Come sit down, you're not ready yet. Please stand. I read, you respond. Come to the edge. Come to the edge. Come to the edge. This is the word of the Lord. Did you get it? You get it? You got the last line? Before you can step out and do what God wants you to do, you got to trust him enough to come to the edge. And then when you're ready to fly, he will push you because he knows you're not going to fall. And that's what a mother eagle does to her eaglets. When it's time for them to fly, she pushes them out the nest. And as they start to fall, she swoops up under them and stops them from falling. And so that's what God does to us. When he pushes us out our nest, when he pushes us out our comfort zone, he knows what's in us. He knows he's put what's in us to fly. And we start flapping our wings or we don't flap our wings. We're there shocked, saying, I can't believe he pushed me out the nest. And we start to sink. Then he swoops down upon us, picks us up, takes us back to the nest. And guess what? Soon as we get comfortable, he does what? Push us out again. And he will push you out until you what? Fly. And when, then when you fly, when you see the eagle flying, when the eagle gets good at flying, they learn that I don't have to flap my wings. Because I got the power of the wind that I can just ride the currents. And that's all they're doing up there. They just ride in the currents. And that's when they're soaring way high. And the last thing about an eagle that I love is you see when the storm clouds come. When the storm clouds come, the eagle doesn't go and hide and take cover like the other birds. You know what the eagle does? He flies up above the clouds and watch the storm pass over. That's why I'm saved. That's why I'm saved. So when God tells us to come to the edge, remember, he's got this. When you're out of your comfort zone, he's not going to let you crash and burn if you trust him enough to let him take care of you and order your steps. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. God be the glory.